Canada has taken a surprising lead in nuclear energy, and I'm going to say something controversial here, but it's pulled ahead of its much larger brother to the south. Let me explain. In the US, no matter how you look at it, things aren't going so well. The big projects at Vogel and VC Summer were, let's be honest, a disaster. Coming in nearly a decade late, if at all, and twice over budget. And NuScale, supposed to be setting the roadmap for future small modular reactors, its flagship project to demonstrate it could be done collapsed because it got too expensive. It just wasn't worth it. Both of these are surely scaring off any would-be investors of any large nuclear projects in the US. Meanwhile, Canada has been quietly setting itself up for success on nuclear energy and actually doing something right. But how it's getting there is not how anyone expected. Canada's famous for several things. Cold winters, hockey, and people who are overly polite. Sorry. I'm sorry. But it also has its own unique type of nuclear plant that is as ubiquitous as maple syrup, the Candu reactor. These homegrown plants have been quietly operating in the background as the country goes about its business for years. After a construction boom in the 70s and 80s, Canada, like many other countries, spent the last several decades in nuclear stagnation, more or less just keeping the same plants running. However, Canada has a special advantage. It's home to some of the largest and highest quality uranium deposits in the world, giving it domestic access to an energy resource that most other countries have to import. Combine this with a commitment to net zero by 2050, and Canada is looking to aggressively expand its nuclear capacity, and it's doing so in a way that will likely put it ahead of other Western countries for years to come. But here's the thing. Despite operating for half a century with Candu reactors, the country could be abandoning the technology that it developed for something else entirely. So to find out what's in store for Canada and how it's overtaken its bigger cousin to the south, we need to answer a few basic questions. First, why did the country experience such a long stagnation until now of nuclear energy? Second, why is the country uniquely positioned to lead? And finally, will it abandon its own technology in favor of something else? Once we do that, we can put Canada, the country that gave Timbits to the world, on the Atomic Blender nuclear energy leaderboard. On paper, Canada's nuclear program looks ideal. The country has vast and highly concentrated uranium reserves, mostly in northern Saskatchewan, meaning it has to extract less ore to get the same amount of uranium compared to other places. And that uranium can easily be put to work. Because the Candu reactor runs on natural uranium, there's no need for the additional and complicated enrichment process used in other designs. This allows for efficient use of the country's uranium material. And there are other features of the Candu design that make it appealing. Candu plants are designed for continuous online refueling, something unheard of for most other nuclear reactors, which must shut down every 12 to 24 months to add more uranium fuel. In fact, Candu designs regularly set operating records, with the Darlington plant outside of Toronto having operated continuously for a whopping three years straight. However, unlike most nuclear reactors, which put the fuel into one large pressurized metal vessel, Candu plants instead put the fuel into hundreds of individually pressurized channels. This has a lot of advantages. The first is that it allows the plant to control the individual power and flow through each of the channels, giving the operators more flexibility. The second is that it means these pressure tubes are easier to manufacture. Unlike most nuclear plants with massive pressure vessels that take months of heavy forging and welding to make, Candu pressure tubes are much smaller, making them easier to fabricate and transport. With all of these advantages, the Candu reactor has been by far the most popular natural uranium design, and third most popular type overall, having been exported all around the world. Yet still, even though things look good on paper, the Canadian nuclear sector hasn't seen much growth recently. Even though Candu reactors can theoretically operate for many years without shutting down for refueling, the actual performance history of the Candu design is less impressive. In practice, the design has shown it needs frequent shutdowns for maintenance and long refurbishment efforts, particularly for those pressure tubes, leading to lower overall capacity factors and availability compared to other designs. Since 1993, no new reactors have come online in Canada, and the country has relied increasingly on renewables and surplus hydropower, especially from the rugged terrain in northern Quebec. This abundance of cheap, clean energy, particularly in the east, has allowed the country to become increasingly electrified. Unlike in the US, most Canadians heat their homes and offices with electricity, not natural gas. Not necessarily out of concern for the environment, but simply because it's easier and cheaper. But with an increasing population and a commitment to net zero emissions, nuclear will play a large part in reaching these goals, with projections showing the need to double nuclear energy to offset closing coal and gas plants. 
And Canada is serious about this. In 2020, the Canadian government announced one of the most comprehensive national approaches to nuclear energy we've ever seen, certainly more coordinated than anything in the US. Focusing on small modular reactors, or SMRs, Canada's created a complete roadmap and action plan that includes everyone from national and provincial governments to industry players and research and development. The plan calls for wide development, demonstration, and deployment of SMRs, both domestically and, interestingly, internationally as well. While we've seen some countries take piecemeal approaches or individual companies focus on specific technologies, we haven't seen anything as comprehensive as Canada's approach. Literally every organization dealing with nuclear energy in Canada is involved in the initiative, including the regulators. The goal of the plan is to deploy multiple SMRs across the country to reduce emissions, decarbonize heavy industry, and create economic development. Its latest round of funding included support for several designs, including molten salt plants by Terrestrial Energy and Multex Energy, as well as the Westinghouse Evinci Microreactor. But what's noticeably missing, though, is any support for any new can-do reactor designs. Despite the country's long history and extensive experience with the can-do plants, the plan only includes refurbishments and life extensions of the existing reactors. It seems that Canada might be looking to move away from its own technology. In 2023, the Darlington station began pre-construction work for the new and non-Canadian GE Hitachi BWRX300 SMR, with plans for up to four of these reactors being built at the site. And over at the Bruce Power Station, already the largest nuclear facility in Canada with eight CANDU reactors, operators announced that they were exploring a further expansion of up to an additional 4,800 megawatts with large plants, but that they were taking a technology-neutral approach, meaning all nuclear technologies, not just CANDU, would be on the table. If they do stick with CANDU technology, the most likely candidate would be the Monarch design, a 1,000 megawatt Generation 3 Plus CANDU reactor, the largest ever. This design incorporates the latest safety features while still being familiar to the operators and would fit well into the country's nuclear infrastructure. The Monarch reactor is proposed by a company called Atkins Realis, which bought the rights to the CANDU technology from the Canadian government in 2011, meaning that for the first time, the CANDU reactor is being marketed by a private company, not the government itself. And following this announcement, other competitors are starting to line up. Westinghouse contracted PwC, the international consulting firm, to perform an economic impact assessment of building four of its AP1000 reactors to meet this new demand. The results showed over $28 billion of immediate GDP impact and creation of nearly 12,000 direct and indirect long-term full-time jobs. Another possibility that not a lot of people are talking about could be GE's ESBWR, the bigger brother of the BWRX300 SMR. If the project at Darlington is successful, then there could be advantages in licensing and operation due to the similarity between the two designs. So it would seem Canada could abandon the technology that it pioneered and exported around the world. But is this a good idea? For one thing, the country has extensive experience with CANDU reactors, with 19 of them operating across the country. The current infrastructure from fuel fabrication, specialized components, and refurbishment services are all set up to support the existing plant design. Introducing different designs would mean a lot of that infrastructure would need to be reworked to support these plants, which could become increasingly expensive. Similarly, operating staff would need to be extensively retrained and qualified on different technologies. This will likely take years and require international specialists to support. Think of it like this. Imagine you had a team of mechanics that had been working on Zambonis for decades. They'd probably know everything about them and how to keep them running smoothly. Now imagine this same team is told to switch from Zamboni ice machines to diesel freight trains. A lot of the principles are going to be the same, but such a radical change will require new training, tools, and probably a different workshop entirely. It's not something that's going to happen overnight. These kinds of indirect costs can be huge and time-consuming, and are not always included in the estimates to build new plants. But there are definitely some benefits to moving away from can-do reactors. For starters, making the switch to a type of nuclear technology used in much of the rest of the world means that the global expertise and operating experience can make things simpler and more efficient. If there are hundreds of similar plants operating, that gives plants a huge database of information and other suppliers to draw from. Not being tied to can-do reactors also means that newer, more innovative designs can be tried. Companies participating in the SMR roadmap include advanced ideas like molten salt and gas-cooled reactors which could give major boosts to efficiency. And successfully building any of these new plants first would make Canada well-positioned for any future expansions in other countries, 
because Canada would have the experience to do it right. And with more and more countries looking to nuclear energy for reducing emissions or improving reliability, they may very well be looking to Canada's experience to get them there. Okay, now let's see how Canada, a country that's re-emerging as a nuclear innovator, does on the Atomic Blender nuclear energy leaderboard, starting with size. Canada has 19 reactors, mostly concentrated near the population centers of the country to the south and east, producing just over 80 terawatt hours of electricity annually. This puts it above average for countries with nuclear energy, so on a scale of 1 to 10, it gets a 7 out of 10. While this is a decent number for the country's size, it's far from being the largest source of energy, that being hydropower, accounting for 60% of the nation's electricity. Nuclear is therefore left with a smaller role, accounting for just 13% of the total electrical output, which is below average of other nuclear countries. So it gets a 4 out of 10. Canada has a decently long history of operating nuclear power, with domestic development beginning jointly with the UK in the 1950s, and then independently thereafter. Most of its current fleet was built in the 70s and 80s, but with very little active development afterwards. Performance has been mixed to say the least, with most plants entering extended downtimes for maintenance and refurbishments, particularly of the pressure tubes, which tend to wear out every 20 years. Still, for operating experience, it gets a 6 out of 10. Infrastructure. Because of its homegrown reactor design, Canada has developed an extensive supply chain, skilled personnel, and necessary fabrication facilities. The country is one of the top places for heavy water nuclear technology, having exported its design around the world. Perhaps its strongest advantage is its massive domestic uranium supplies, far more than the country needs for itself. This supply ensures domestic energy security for decades to come. And as other countries, like the US, begin to ban imports of uranium from Russia, things really are looking good for Canada. However, sources of heavy water, which would be essential for new can-do reactors in the country, have been challenged recently, with attempts to finally restart production only now just getting underway. Still, it gets an easy 9 out of 10. Finally, growth. Nuclear output has been flat over the last decade, with only minor improvements to the existing plants. Increasing use of hydropower and other renewables have also reduced nuclear energy's role in the country. However, as we've seen here, government support is exceptionally strong, and long-term policies are actively supporting building many, many more plants in the future. So it gets a 6 out of 10. Overall, that gives Canada a final score of 6.4, putting it just above Ukraine and below China. A score that will certainly improve if we see the planned expansion take off. And unlike a lot of others, Canada found positive success internationally. So check out this video to see how India became the largest operator of the Kandu design and where they're going with it next. So thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. <laughs>